Newton Calvary. Wonderful to have you here today. Praise God. Thank you for coming together as the body of Christ to worship Jesus. It's all about the name of Jesus and who he is that brings us together. Would you stand with me as I read from Psalms chapter 34? I will bless the Lord at all times. His praise shall continually be in my mouth. My soul makes its boast in the Lord. Let the humble hear and be glad. Oh, magnify the Lord with me, and let us exalt his name together. Let's pray. Father, we come today with lots of different burdens and cares and things on our minds, and yet we're able to just release them all to the comfort and companionship of the Holy Spirit and to come together as your family, brothers and sisters in Christ, and exalt the name of Jesus, whose praise is continually on our lips. Let us today, with enthusiasm and sincerity, praise the name of Jesus, for at his name, at his name, is life. Amen. At your name, the mountains shake and crumble. your name, the oceans roar and tumble, at your name, angels will bow, the earth will rejoice, your people cry. Skies with endless praise and 
as we shout praise to our Heavenly Father. Let's give the Lord and His goodness a round of applause. Let's praise Him, for He is good. You may be seated. We are gathered here this morning to praise our Heavenly Father and recognize that salvation comes through Jesus Christ and Christ alone. I'm Pastor Josh, and I have just a few announcements for you this morning. Next Sunday morning, January 19th, starting at 845, during our normal Faith Builders time, which is Sunday school, we are going to have a ministry partner forum, and we are going to be sharing with you and also hearing your input on the future pastoral needs that we have here at Calvary. So make sure you're here next Sunday morning at 845 for that forum. Also coming up is our Jubilee Sunday in two weeks. That's our annual event where we celebrate what the Lord has done in the last year and we look ahead with excitement at what the Lord is going to do and we start with a full breakfast at 8 o'clock. So scrambled eggs, pancakes, sausage, all the good stuff. Make sure you're here sometime in between 8 and 9.30 to get breakfast and then our normal service at 10.15. It's a time where we're going to study the goodness of God, but we're also going to celebrate what he did by paying our debt so quickly, and uh, we're going to have a mortgage burning. How awesome. So that'll be in two weeks. Be sure to be here that Sunday. Also coming up, ladies, is your monthly event. It's called Let's Get Real. Real people, real issues, real victory. Every month you're going to have something. It's going to be the fourth Saturday of every month, and the first one is going to start January 25th at 10 a.m. right here. You'll notice child care is available. If you have any questions, contact information is down there on the bottom. You can always call the church office for more information, but mark that in your calendars, ladies, 10 a.m. on that date, the 25th, excuse me. Also, we have some exciting news. We love to celebrate babies, don't we? Yeah, and we have some missionaries, Ben and Danielle Colbinson, missionaries with Navigators over in River Falls. They just welcomed Bethany Marie Colbinson to a household of boys. They now, this is their third, they've got a little girl. And so we just celebrate with them. If you would like to uh, give them a note, their information is in your directory, and uh, you can always call the office if you want to send them a little something. We can arrange that as well, but welcome to Bethany Marie Colbinson. Finally, the last thing I want to mention is last week you saw a video on maybe some of the changes we're going to be making with some updated um, data management and people management here at Calvary. It's called Planning Center. And unfortunately, it looks like it got cut off on the bottom there. One thing that I need from you is we're going to start transitioning our emails instead of coming just from the normal Sue Moss which is who normally sends out all of our emails, they're now going to be directed through Planning Center. So one of the things that you need to do, and we'll be sure to send this out this week, on the bottom you can't see it, but I need you to make sure that no reply at planningcenteronline.com is authorized to send emails to you. Some of you may have it blocked because you thought it was spam or something like that, but that'll be something we're going to be working on this week so that no one is left off the email list. We're going to fix that slide so you can read it. We're going to publish that website or that email address so that you make sure that it's not blocked and it doesn't go to your clutter folder. So we're going to be working through that. There it is. Check it out. Nice job on the fly. There's the email address that you need to just make sure isn't blocked. And we will go through this process slowly to make sure no one is left behind. But start thinking about these changes so that we can better serve you with our management software. Those are just a few of the announcements. There's a lot more in your connector, and so I need you to just stay up to date with that, put things in your calendar, and be in prayer for the things there. But at this time, I'd like to invite our ushers forward because we have just the honor and the privilege to give and be part of what the Lord is doing. And so that's what all of your resources go to here at Calvary is the mission, the cause of Christ Jesus, our Savior. And so would you just pray with me? Father, thank you so much for all of the 
all of the generosity that fills this place. And I thank you for the hearts of the people here that always are excited to be part of your cause. The people here at Calvary that you have placed in this body are generous with their time. They love to serve. And they're excited to give because they know that what they give is going to go towards the gospel message, whether it be right here in the Chippewa Valley or around the world. So I thank you for the generosity and the spirit in this place. Would you multiply these gifts and make everything about Jesus Christ so that more people hear the gospel and come to you? Thank you for allowing us to be part of this. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. As the ushers are receiving our tithes and offerings, I'm going to invite Jane Vandenberg up. Jane has been a supported missionary of Calvary for many years, and maybe she'll give you the exact number, but she's going to update you. We had the privilege this morning of hearing a full update during our Sunday school time. She's going to update you on what is happening in her life, and um, she is actually going to be retired very soon, April 30th, I think you said, right? So she is um, making her rounds to give updates to churches, and we're excited to join with you, hear your updates. So would you just tell us what's on your heart this morning? Good morning. As I come up to retirement, there are three words that I would like to say to you. Um, thank you, goodbye, and please pray. You as a church have been with me since the beginning of my missionary career back in 1978. And I want to thank you for that. Next. You remember perhaps that I was appointed to serve in the Ivory Coast as an RN, which I did until 1991. It was a grueling time and ended in bitter disillusionment. It was really tough. But you stuck, me with, me. You stuck with me through it all. Even so, God granted that two good things come out of that time. One was the vaccination clinic, and one was the community health program, a testimony to his grace. The Baptist Medical Center of Turogo presented me with a wall hanging in appreciation for that initiative when I had my retirement party in Ivory Coast. From the dispensary, I transitioned to literacy teacher trainer and literacy development facilitator. You stood by me with during these satisfying years as well, and truly they were a blessing to me. Praise God. <coughs> that many of these literacy programs with which I worked now have a significant readership and large portions of scripture that they can read in their own language. This truly is a team effort that God has sustained over all these years since I've gone on to other things, not anything that I have done at all. This too was recognized at my retirement party and it is also by the grace of God alone. During that period came the idea of a girls' vocational school. It was waylaid by the war in 2002 and following, and during that time I worked on my master's in continuing education. But, by, uh, but in the end, I saw the fulfillment of that dream, and you have been with me through that whole time as well. Thank you. I wrote curriculum when I could, and that I loved. I worked on construction a lot, and that I didn't love quite so well. <laughs> but I learned a lot. And I lived to see the opening of the local church in 2018, the church that um, was part of the master plan and the church that is to serve the community in which the school exists. They average 300 people on Sunday morning right now and it's only been open since 2018. What a testimony to God's grace. In 2016, the Girls Christian Vocational School opened. It's a school that all of us have prayed for for all these years. 
Who would have ever dreamed that such a thing could really ever happen? Certainly not I. But look what God did. The farther we went, the more grandiose and imposing it became. And I just have to stand back in wonder and amazement at what God has done. Who would ever have thought that it could be what it is today? Pray for the administrative staff. Only the administrative assistant who is seated beside me has been there since the beginning. She's the only one that really knows what's going on. The director um, has been there since September of this year, uh, no, 2019. And the bookkeeper has been in place for just a little over a year. They really need your prayers. Now I'm retiring. The words that I want to say to you are thank you. The gifts that you have sent are a fragrant offering, an acceptable sacrifice to God from Philippians 4.18. I also want to say goodbye. That sounds awful, but what else do you say when you're retiring? Anyway, the third thing I want to say is please pray. I leave all of this to ones who will come after me, and who knows whether they will be wise or foolish. Those are words from Ecclesiastes 2, 18 and 19. Pray that God will grant that they be wise and not fools. Thank you. And please pray. Jane was able to uh, very briefly summarize 41 years worth of mission work in just those few minutes, but there's so much more, and there's so much more on her heart. So I would encourage you to stop by her table, ask her questions. There is so much that the Lord did in the Ivory Coast through Jane's faithfulness and her servant heart. And uh, one of the things that is difficult as she works towards reti retirement here in the next couple months is what is the next thing the Lord has for her? Because her heart of ministry does not stop just because she's retiring. And so what is that going to look like? And so she shared this morning that that's a prayer request she has. What is the Lord doing? What are the next steps for her? What is her involvement still in the Ivory Coast, if any? And so would you just rally in, in support and prayer with us for her? And at this time, I'd like one of the uh, members from the, our mission team to come up. We have a card for you, Jane, and just a small token of your faithful service that uh, we want to present to you. And so would you just all rally in support with prayer right now for Jane in her retirement and celebration of what she's done? Father, thank you. Uh, we, don't, we don't call attention to people. We call attention to what you have done, Lord. But we also recognize the faithfulness of your servants. Right now, we want to just celebrate the faithfulness of Jane. Thank you for the vision you've given her. Thank you for the faithfulness that she has. Thank you for all of the effort she's put in, the work but Lord, I thank you most of all for her perspective because in her eyes, it's not been work. It's been a privilege. And I know it's gonna to continue to feel like a privilege as you have ministry planned for her, whether it be right here in Wisconsin as she retires or whether she still has connections to the school, the administration or, or wherever you have her. Thank you for her faithfulness. Would you just inspire her today? Would you let her know that we love her, that what you have done through her is awesome, and your work is always great, Lord. Thank you for your answer to prayer, and I just um, thank you most of all for Jesus, because it's his gospel message. It's salvation in Jesus Christ that we all gather here today, and that is the message that we want all over the world. Thank you for Jane's part of that. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you. just rise as we step into a time of worship.
my heart, Lord. Open the eyes of my heart. I want to see you. I want to see you. To see you high and lifted up. Shining in the light of your glory. Pour out your power and love as we sing holy, holy, holy. See you high and lifted up. Shining in the light of your glory. Pour out your power and love as we sing holy, holy. Psalms 150, 1 through 6. Praise the Lord. Praise God in his sanctuary. Praise him in his mighty heavens. Praise him for his mighty deeds. Praise him according to his excellence, excellent greatness. Praise him with trumpet sound. Praise him with lute and harp. Praise him with tambourine and dance. Praise him with strings and pipe. Praise him with sounding cymbals. Praise him with loud crashing cymbals. Let everything that has breath praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. I think as we look at that, it's pretty evident we're supposed to praise him. And we're supposed to praise him in everything that we do. And I just think that as we enter into this next song, we're really thinking about why we're singing and why as a congregation we come together to sing. We come together to sing to praise him. And that's all that we're here for. And that's what we were created to do, is to glorify and to praise God. And I just think we really need to come back to that, the praise that's in our heart. We count on one thing. The same God that never fails cannot fail us now. You won't fail us now. In the waiting, the same God who's never late is working all things out, working all things out. Yes, we will lift you high in the lowest valley, and yes, we will bless your name. same God that never fails cannot fail us now. He 
won't fail us now in the waiting. The same God who's never late is working all things out, working all things out. And yes, we will lift you high in the lowest valley. Yes, we will bless your name. Let's practice that for a moment, shall we? Can we just let loose with an appropriate measure of expression of the praise that's in your heart? Maybe you like to clap. Maybe you like to do one of the tray woo-hoos or something, you know? Maybe you like to just quietly, in your spirit, just tell God something you love about Him. All expressions of praise are acceptable. But will you take a moment to do that right now? Any way you feel like, will you just praise God right now? Thank you. You may be seated. Thank you. Parents, you can escort your children back to Discover Link. And I want to... Uh, uh, spend a little uh, time here in what we call Selah, our prayer time, uh, where we just take a pause and we reflect on what God is doing in our hearts. And I, I just want to have a little moment of pastoral intimacy with you. Um, things are really tough right now. Things are really tough. We as a body are grieving the loss of one of our pastors who has re, uh, resigned and moved on. Ministries are being affected because of that. And How many of you like change? <laughs> how many of you endure change if it's one thing at a time? We have a multiplicity of things going on. Changes in leadership in our Levite team. Uh, God moving people, the Holy Spirit moving people from one ministry to another, leaving holes in the spot that they left, but we know they're supposed to leave there because look at what God is doing over here and using them. And so we have at least two, maybe three lead team positions available just in our worship and technical team ministries that are all of a sudden evacuated because the Holy Spirit said, I need you over there to direct that and to lead that. It's hard. And there's just this spirit of, oh, what's going to happen? And then you add on top of that all the changes that are going on in people's lives. On 
a week ago Friday, my wife's mother fell and broke her ankle. And uh, she didn't know she broke it. Uh, and she stayed at home hobbling around on it for five days before she finally decided she better go to the doctor. And the doctor said, yeah, you broke uh, uh, both bones that attach to the ankle from your, from your shin, your leg, the, whatever they are, the tibia and the fibula, okay? Or something like that. I don't know. Did I get that right, Ed? I did? Okay. She broke both of them right at the top of the ankle there or the front of the ankle where they attach. And we don't know yet whether she'll need surgery, but she was told immediately to get off that foot and not do anything. So on Thursday, I loaded Denise up in the car, and I took her to North Dakota, and I left her there and came home on Saturday, and that's where she is. And I don't know when she's coming home. <laughs> it all depends on whether they choose to do surgery or not. If they choose to do surgery, we'll get some rehab for her, and then Denise can come home. If they don't do surgery, Denise could be there for five to six weeks until she's able to walk again on her foot. Kyle Fagerlin, my good friend, and part of our church is not here this morning because he's sitting at the hospital next to his father who's dying. I was there at the hospital yesterday with them. Changes, transitions in life. James Allen, wondering when their house is finally going to sell so that they can move to be closer to Whitney's new job and what God has in store for him. Changes and uncertainty. The grieving that's going on within our ministries in the church over all these changes because nobody really likes change. And all the needs we have to fill positions. But God has provided us an answer for all of them. Amen. And this morning, every one of you, I bet, in here saw the answer unless you didn't look in a mirror because if you looked in the mirror you saw God's answer you volunteering to get involved and to serve and to help you are the answer and the Holy Spirit is going to direct you as we pray right now our Father you know how how heavy my heart is. Um, there, there was a day I can still remember from my past when all of these things would just be a daily challenge and good, how are we going to watch God do it? But as we get older, they become more of a burden and yet you are not less of a burden bearer. You have not changed, we have. We have changed our perspective, we have changed our focus, we have changed our trust level, we have changed our preferences, we have changed our emotional responses, we have changed. Today I'm asking you, Lord, for myself, and including all of the people here that are listening live or out there in media land somewhere. That God has provided his Holy Spirit to each one of his disciples and has gifted them to rise up and serve in the local church and to be involved. And I just pray that you will lay it on people's hearts where they can step up and serve their Savior. And I pray for the people that are hurting and stepping out of their comfort zones to minister to others like Denise way out in North Dakota right now in the cold and wondering how in the world to get her mother out of the house to even get to the doctor. I think of Kyle and the loss for their family of their dad, James Allen and the sale of his house. I think, Lord, of all of our dear friends in the Philippines, 
who for the last couple of months in the southern part of the Philippines have had two major earthquakes that have affected our ministry there through uh, Midwest Evangelistic Association and Hank Rosso, churches that have been destroyed. And now today the news of the volcano just 42 miles south of Manila that has erupted and spewing ash all over that great city that's even affecting businesses that are represented by people in our church who have representatives there. And uh, the word is that there is a major eruption coming that could devastate that part of our world. And Father, we see lots of your signs for us to get our attention. You told us in the last days that there would be signs that would happen in weather and in uh, uh, world events. And all of these signs are to get our attention to turn to you and to trust you for even these signs are an expression of your goodness. God, we cannot stop to remember how great thou art. We cannot stop remembering. We dare not forget how great you are and that none of these things, none of them, are a surprise to you and they're certainly not much of an effort for you but are all designed by you to draw us into a deeper love relationship with you. And so in this prayer time today, we first of all submit our hearts and our lives to trusting you completely no matter what is happening. And then we pray that the people that are being affected by all of these things will trust you turn their hearts toward you and that where you want to resolve the crisis you will do that because it will bring you the most glory in their lives where they need to endure it it will bring you the most glory if they endure it and that we trust you with whatever your decisions are in managing all of these things and we pray for a spirit Lord I do of enthusiasm about the future to come across this body of believers at Calvary. Not a looking back and wondering what might have been or what will be, but a spirit of enthusiasm that it is going to be your Holy Spirit giving us more and more grace which is sufficient for every day so that we can accomplish your purpose of bringing the redemptive cause of Christ to the whole world. I pray that we will enthusiastically bond together as a body of believers to see Jesus Christ do great things. And I pray this in your name, Jesus. Amen. Well, thank you for letting me have that little personal time with you. If you have your Bibles, you can prepare for where we're going to be in the book of Proverbs today in our study of Proverbs by turning to the 18th chapter of Proverbs. Um, 18th chapter of Proverbs. We're, uh, we started last week this uh, sermon series, which is actually going to take us all the way up to Palm Sunday on Proverbs for Life, Wisdom for Everyday Living. And before we dive into, starting next week, some of the principles for living, we need to look today at who are the principles that are living. The book of Proverbs describes a variety of types of people. And underneath two main categories, we find lots of other people addressed. The two main categories of people that are addressed in Proverbs, whether politically correct or not to call them this, are the wise and the foolish. The two categories of people are the wise and the foolish. And somewhere on that spectrum between being 
totally a fool and being totally wise, every one of us lives. Every one of us exists somewhere on that spectrum. And Solomon and the other authors of Proverbs, under the power of the Holy Spirit, wrote the book of Proverbs so that we could determine where we are on the spectrum and that we're making progress away from foolishness and toward wisdom. Underneath the main categories of the wise and the foolish, we find the contrast of multiple other types of people. For example, there's a contrast between the prudent and the simple. And throughout this sermon series, you'll discover some of the qualities of each one. Not today, we're going to stick to just the wise and the foolish today, but I wanted you to see how all of the other categories fit under one of these two main ones, the prudent and the simple. Or how about the contrast between the industrious and the sluggard? The person who works hard and the person who won't work. How about the contrast between the worshiper and the scorner, the one who scorns the things of God? Or the contrast between the rich and the poor? The contrast between the righteous and the wicked? The contrast between the humble and the proud? Every one of those in the first column on the left would be listed under the category of wise. Everyone under the column on the right would be listed as a fool. Now, I know some of your eyes are going right away to the fourth one down, the rich and the poor. How dare you call a poor person a fool? Proverbs addresses poverty and poor people in a way that says their poorness is of their own making. It is not unwise to be poor. Every one of us, comparatively, is poor. Every one of us needs to be poor in spirit in order to experience the grace of God. But in Proverbs, the poor are addressed as those who are intentionally staying there and making unwise, foolish decisions that keep them in that position. So I just wanted to make sure that you weren't distracted from the rest of the sermon by thinking that pastor made a mistake. Okay, I probably will make mistakes in this sermon, but uh, you can talk about that. They're certainly not intentional. We could spend a lot of time looking at all the passages in Proverbs that describe each of these kinds of people. But I believe it will be both encouraging as well as convicting for us just to look at some general contrasts between the two main subjects, the wise and the foolish. Now when you're studying contrasts, one option is to study only one of them and discover what is true about that one and then assume that the opposite of that will be true about the one to whom you are contrasting. So we could study the foolish person and then draw conclusions about who the wise must be. Or we could study the wise and draw conclusions about who the fool is. The 18th chapter of Proverbs studies the fool. And from that we can conclude things about the wise. But just listing all the characteristics of the fool quickly becomes negative and it leads us leads me toward judgment and condemnation. So today, after studying the 18th chapter of Proverbs, I would like to draw the positive conclusions about what wise people are like, who they are. I've studied all the negative characteristics and I've put into a few categories then what must be true about a wise person. And my hope is that we will see a little of ourselves in each one of the characteristics and that we will embrace the wise ones and correct the foolish ones. So let's dive in. In the first three verses of Proverbs 18, and you have a little write-on sheet in your connector that you can fill in the blanks, and the blanks will be underlined when you... uh, Oh, I guess they're not underlined, sorry. Uh, Wise people... We read in Proverbs 18, 1 to 3, which we'll read in a moment, wise people see life from God's perspective. 
Listen to these verses describing a fool and then see if you can glean from it the things that are there about a wise person. <clears throat> Whoever isolates himself seeks his own desire. He breaks out against all sound judgment. A fool takes no pleasure in understanding, but only in expressing his opinion. When wickedness comes, contempt comes also, and with dishonor comes disgrace. If you, if you look carefully at that, you discover that a fool is a person who isolates themselves from all of the input of other people into their lives and take no pleasure in learning anything that's new. In other words, they only see life from their own perspective. They only care that life works out the way I want it to work out. They only care that... that uh, Something is done now that there's change taking place that is going to match my preferences for how it should be fixed. That describes the fool. So then, it must also be true that the wise person sees life from a different perspective. And the highest perspective from which to see life is God's perspective. So I... I broke down those first three verses and found five principles that can be true of your life. If you're looking for, Pastor, give me something that's a principle that I can work on, that I can work on, uh, stop. None of this is so that you can work on it. Because that just feeds into our performance-based mentality that I have to somehow fix it and measure up to something that God has for me. No. God, the Holy Spirit, has been given to each of us to dwell in us so that he will accomplish this in our lives if we partner with him. The most important decision you can make about becoming a wise person is not to learn wisdom's principles and then practice them every day so that you do them. The most important decision you can make is to partner with the Holy Spirit who is teaching you those principles and the Holy Spirit will produce that in your life so that he gets the glory and you get the growth. He gets the glory and you get the growth. We live in a try harder culture. Just keep trying harder. Keep trying harder. Do more and more. Oh, Pastor, you pointed out to me today that there's some things I really have to fix. You can't fix them. Sorry. You can't. I can't. We can't, but we can partner with the one who can, and we can join him in his work to allow him to change us from the inside out. So the first thing I see in verse 1, whoever isolates himself seeks his own desire. Wise people live in community. Wise people live in community. Isn't that exciting? What we see right here, all over this uh, auditorium, some people in a little closer-knit community than others because you're sitting with no chairs in between you. Others with chairs in between you, you're still community. And wise people choose to enhance the nature of that community rather than continue to isolate yourself. I see husbands moving closer to their wives right now. That's such a blessing. Thank you, Steve. <laughs> it's, it's so great that God said the very first principle of seeing life from my perspective is to see it as a community. Because isn't that the expression of the Trinitarian nature of God himself? Who has God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit live in intimate, perfect community with each other to accomplish an eternal purpose. And that's the nature of community that God wants expressed in the church. Wise people live in community. Secondly, wise people look to the interests of others, not self. Whoever isolates himself seeks his own desire. So wise people look to the interests of others, not just to themselves. I was tired yesterday. I got up at, well, 
I haven't been sleeping because I had to take some medicine for gout in my foot, and then that makes me tense and irritable and upset, and then I don't sleep at night. So the three nights, or the two nights that I spent with my wife up in North Dakota, um, uh, I probably had about two to three hours sleep both nights. I woke up at about 3 a.m. Uh, yesterday morning, tried to go back to sleep, couldn't, got up at 5 a.m., got in the car and started home. And uh, when, by the time I got home here at about 12.15 yesterday at no, the noon hour, uh, I was really tired. But the whole way home, I had been calling and communicating, uh, voice messaging. I was safe in the car. <laughs> Dusty, don't arrest me. Um, I, I was communicating with Kyle about the condition of his dad. It would have been so easy for me to just say, I just had a traumatic experience taking my wife and dropping her off in North Dakota, and I'm, I'm tired, and I'm irritable, and I'm just going to look to my own interests right now. And the whole way home, I stayed in communication with Kyle, and I got into town, and I went straight to the hospital and went up and spent about a half hour, 45 minutes just sitting and chatting and praying with them and talking and leaning over and praying with his dad who was pretty much under the effects of the morphine. But uh, it would have been easy just to say, no, I'm just going to look to my own interests right now. But a wise person constantly looks at the interests of others. Thirdly, wise people grow in knowledge. The fool breaks out against all sound judgment. See that in verse 1? The fool breaks out against all sound judgment. They don't want to hear your advice. You don't want anybody giving you input into what's going on in your life. They, you certainly, we don't want anybody telling us how to change and how to do it differently. But the wise person grows in knowledge always seeking more and more information. It's amazing in this information age in which we live how dumb we are all becoming. Really. I'm sorry, but that's not politically correct, I know, right? But we are becoming dumber. The dumbing down of our culture because we live face-planted into this which denies the very essence of wisdom, which is community. Wise people focus on growing in knowledge. And fourthly, wise people focus on truth, not opinion. Oh, i got to be careful here now. The fool takes no pleasure in understanding, but only in expressing his opinion. How many of you have ever participated in an opinion poll? Why? Why? Especially in this modern culture when you know that the, the results of that opinion poll are going to be discarded if they don't match the intended outcome of the person who created it or they're going to be magnified if they do match it to try to create a cultural impact that is going to sway everybody else's opinion to get something the way they want it. Because opinion in our culture matters more than truth. And the Bible calls everybody who does that a, you can say the word, a fool. It is truth, not opinion, that carries wisdom. And fifthly, when wickedness comes, contempt comes also, and with dishonor comes disgrace. In other words, fools are dishonored, therefore wise people will be honored. Wise people will be honored. We're going to come back to that. If you keep reading through the 18th chapter, verses 4 through 8, and then verse 13, this is what we read. The words of a man's mouth are deep waters. The fountain of wisdom is a bubbling brook. It is not good to be partial to the wicked or to deprive the righteous of justice. A fool's lips walk into a fight, and his mouth invites a beating. 
A fool's mouth is his ruin, and his lips are a snare to his soul. The words of a whisperer are like delicious morsels. They go down into the inner parts of the body. Verse 13, if one gives an answer before he hears, it is his folly and shame. This whole section of verses talks about the next principle of wisdom. Wise people are careful with their words. Some of you know, and I'm humbly here to be again addressed this way because I know it's true of me, that this next section applies more to me than it does to you. I am not always very wise with my words. I am not always one who carefully thinks about what I'm going to say. I just say what I think. And that is foolish. And some of you have the great grace of God to address me on it. And we sit down over coffee and we talk about it. And I repent until I do it again. <laughs> because I need a lot of growth in that area. Am I the only one? Thank you, thank you, thank you. But look at what the scripture says. Verse 4, the words of a man's mouth are deep waters. The fountain of wisdom is a bubbling brook. Look at the contrast between the fool in the first half of that and the wise person in the second half. The fool becomes just deep waters that stagnate and out of it comes ugly smelling stuff. <clears throat> the town in North Dakota where my wife is right now, where she grew up, is, uh, is undergoing a radical change. And that radical change is that uh, uh, when, when my wife and I went to high school there, uh, the area to the north of town and to the west of town, and now it's even filtering over into the east of town, that whole area was all hayland. All the sloughs were dry. They were hayed every year for all the cattle. And there was productive crop growing and everything. I was talking to one of my friends that graduated a couple years before I did uh, at the store on uh, Friday morning. And uh, he said, uh, I said, so how's it going this year, Harvey? And he said, it's the worst farming year I've ever had the worst farming year I ever had. He said, do you remember the house where we first lived when we got married? And I said, yeah, it was the old Baptist parsonage out north of town by where the old church once stood near the cemetery. He said, you know that road that went from the highway down to our farmstead where we lived? Yep. He said, do you know that right now on top of that road is 27 feet of water? 27 feet of water. There is over a foot to 15 inches of ice on the lake that now covers 29 feet deep in its deepest spot that I understand. 29 feet deep in a lake that used to be a barely couple of inches of water slough. 29 feet of depth and there's 15 inches of ice on it and the water is still flowing out of the culverts flooding additional land. As I was driving, coming home yesterday, and I was uh, between Verona and Gwinner, there is an area of lowland that's pretty much all sloughs, if you know what a slough is, out in the Dakotas. And there's so much stagnant water in those sloughs from not having any drainage that even through the ice, how many of you know what a slough smells like by the end of summer? Okay. That's what it smells like through the ice. You can still smell the stink. That's the word picture you need to have that when wickedness and foolishness comes into a life, it stinks. And their words bring forth nothing but vomitous stink. But a wise man is a bubbling brook. Isn't that refreshing? Which one do you want to drink from? The words of wise people are delightful. But also the words of wise people are just. Verse 5. It is not good to be partial to the wicked or to deprive the righteous of 
justice. It is foolish to talk unjustly about other people. Foolish. To speak quickly and assume that they did something for a reason that they had no intention of doing. Wise people think carefully and their words are just. But in verses 6 and 7 it also says that the words of wise people bring peace. A fool's words walk into a fight and his mouth invites a beating. Did you see that in there? His mouth invites a beating. A fool's mouth is his ruin and his lips are a snare to his soul. I, while I was watching, a, I, think, I think it was supposed to be called a football game yesterday afternoon. <laughs> um, while I was watching that uh, with my son and his kids, um, one of Josh's younger boys sitting on the couch next to him making very foolish challenges to his dad. <laughs> I'm going to pop you. I'm going to slug you. I'm going to get you. I'm going to make you pay for that. He couldn't. He didn't have any chance of measuring up to those words. His dad took him down very quickly. A fool's lips invite a beating. But a wise person, a wise person brings peace. Let me give you a quick, I think they're on your list there. Here's 10 commandments of human relations to use your words wisely. This is just a bonus for you. Let me go through them quickly, but they're on your list, aren't they? Okay, good. All right, 10 commandments of human relations. Speak to people cheerfully. Speak to people cheerfully. When somebody says hi to you, uh, hi. No. Yeah, I don't understand what you're going through in your life. I have no way of knowing what you're going through in your life until after I ask you what's going on in your life, and then you're honest enough to tell me. But with that initial greeting, speak cheerfully. Smile at people sincerely. Don't fake it. I'm doing okay. Can't wait to see the video of that. I don't know what that looked like. <clears throat> Number three, use people's names. Use people's names. I was out with somebody the other day, and uh, the waitress is in this particular place where I was eating, so you know it wasn't Randy's. They all wear name badges. Okay? So when a waitress that's wearing a name badge comes up to my table, I say hi, and then I look at her name so I can use her name and call her by name. And if I'm at Randy's where they don't know, know name bad, wear name badges, what do I do? I ask for their name. I ask. Guys, wise people representing Jesus Christ who desires to bring more people <clears throat> into the community of believers needs his followers to be friendly so that they're inviting and they're relating to people, and they're talking to people. Use their names. Be friendly to people. Be interested in people. Ask what's going on in their lives. How many of you have ever sat down to have a conversation with somebody that you haven't seen for a long time, and you begin to share what's, you begin to ask them questions. So what's going on in your life? Where are you working now? How are your kids? How are your grandkids? How are things going at your job? What's going on with your recreation? Are you having a good time? All the rest. And you realize that after an hour of them explaining everything about their life to you because you asked, they never once asked you one thing. How disheartening. How disheartening. Community. Share with each other. Bring peace by being interested in people. Be generous with praise and be cautious with criticism. Generous with praise. Be considerate of people's feelings and be patient with them. Be patient with them. <laughs> just, just realize that the hardest place to do that is when you're driving a car. Oh, my goodness. 
Last night I was coming home from the Selvig home where we watched the football game. I was coming home and I got on Claremont to come down the hill and there was a guy in front of me. I almost called and reported his license number. He had to be intoxicated. He was driving a car. Uh, there was a headlight that wasn't working and there was a taillight that wasn't working and he kept going over into the bank and then would come across the lane the other way and I said, you know, he was going about 35 miles an hour and I thought, I know I have to turn at the bottom of the hill but I'm going to get around him. So I came out behind him and he drifted right over into me so I tapped my horn and I pulled out in front of him and he laid on his horn and he pulled up right behind me bumper to bumper and just laid on his horn and laid on his horn and I just did nothing except make sure he didn't hit me in the rear end. We get so impatient. I could have stayed behind him. See, that story wasn't about his impatience. It was about mine. I felt like I had to get around him. Why? Let him go ahead. He'll hit somebody else. But I didn't want that either. Be patient with people. And then 8, 9, and 10, serve people. Be a servant. Trust people. And have a sense of humor. And be humble. Have a sense of humor. Wise people are careful with their words because their words will bring life and healing. Verse 8, the words of a whisperer are like the delicious morsels. They go down into the inner parts of the body. What do you think the word whisperer there means in that verse? Gossip, exactly. The words of a gossip are like delicious morsels. A gossip is a fool with a good sense of rumor. Come on. Come on. You had to get that better than that. <laughs> Here's what Ray Ortland says. Pastor Ray Ortland. Listen to this quote. Let's admit it. We love gossip. We love negative information that tears others down. We love controversy. We find it delicious. It's a delicacy to our corrupt hearts. We gulp down such words, not realizing that they are making us sicker than we were before. <clears throat> Boy, that's powerful. A wise person brings life and healing, not rumor. And a wise person always listens before they speak. If one gives an answer before he hears, it is his folly and shame his folly and shame. Listen first before you answer. Number three principle in chapter 18, verse 9, it says this, whoever is slack in his work is a brother to him who destroys. In other words, wise people love to work hard. Wise people love to work hard. This is the contrast between wisdom, the industrious person, and the sluggard, the one who tries to get out of work all the time. That's foolish. And parents, it's not wrong to use that word with your kids when you're teaching them to work hard, to teach them the biblical principle of being a fool. Because people who don't like to work are fools. Because God gave us work as a part of the original created order. Prior to sin even coming into the world, God said to Adam, work the garden and take care of it for me. Work is not your enemy. Work is your friend. It brings you into a deeper relationship with God. You're a fool if you don't accept that. Wise people work hard by always doing their best. Colossians 3, verses 23 to 24, whatever you do, work hard heartily as for the Lord and not for men. Work heartily. Wise people always do their best and wise people would rather build up than destroy. Wise people would rather build up than destroy. Those principles you can find as you study through the rest of chapter 18. There's three more points I want to allude to here just to give you a stimulus to study more and uh, what I've done for your life group study guide this week is I've taken four main categories of people that are listed 
under the wise and the foolish. I've taken four categories of people, and I've pulled out most of the verses from Proverbs that define who those people are and given you an opportunity in your life groups to talk about it. Look up those verses and say, oh, yeah, that probably is something that uh, shouldn't be in my life anymore, and I've got to take that to the Lord. So uh, you, can, you can grab those life group study guides in the Connecting Center or online at our website. But uh, fourthly, wise people pursue God. Wise people pursue God. The pursuit of God is to be the foundation of our lives. And putting into action what we learn about God is to be the product of the pursuit of God. Jesus told a story about that in, the, in one of his parables when he said, hey, you guys, I want to tell you about a wise person and a foolish person. And both of them relate to what they do with what they know about me. That if you know this is true about me, then this is what you will do. And if you do it, then you are like the wise person who built a house on rock. And when the winds came up and the storms of life came up, it couldn't blow the house over because he had the right foundation of obedience to the word of God. That's wisdom. And the other person who doesn't listen to what they know to be true about God and doesn't apply it to their lives is the foolish one who built his house on the beach. And then when the tsunami comes, like they're predicting in the Philippines right now because of the volcano, when the tsunami comes, it washes it away because it has no footing, which is your life. Wise people pursue God, and part of the pursuit of God is the practice of what you know to be true about God. Fifthly, wise people trust God. Look at verse 11. A rich man's wealth is his strong city, and like a high wall in his imagination. In other words, what are you trusting? You trusting in the wealth of men? You trusting in your own ability to provide for yourselves? You trusting in your own skill levels? Or are you trusting in God? Foolishness trusts in what this world offers. Wisdom trusts in what God provides. And then finally, wise people will be honored for their humility. I told you we were coming back to that, that wise people are honored. Look at verse 12. Before destruction, a man's heart is haughty. How many of you remember that verse going like this? Pride goeth before a fall. You memorized that in the King James Version probably. The same verse. Before destruction, a man's heart is haughty, proud. But humility comes before honor. Listen to this quote. Humility is the divine veil that hides our good deeds from our own eyes. Oh, that's powerful. Humility is the divine veil that hides our good deeds from our own eyes so that we never take credit for anything. And most of the time, we don't even know that we're doing it. We're just doing it. In 1994, Thurman Thomas, great running back for the Buffalo Bills, sat on the bench at the end of their fourth straight Super Bowl loss. I know what that feels like. He sat on the bench with his head in his hands. He had fumbled three times during that game, sealing their fate as Super Bowl losers once again. Suddenly, standing in front of him, Carrying his goddaughter was Emmett Smith of the Dallas Cowboys who had just been named the MVP for that Super Bowl game. And Smith looked at his goddaughter and then pointed at Thurman Thomas and said, Honey, I want you to meet the greatest running back in the NFL. Humility. Humility. Do you do your good deeds so that men will see you? It's foolish. 
Do you live out the life of Christ simply because it's the life of Christ in you and you can't help yourself because you've been captivated by the life of Christ? That's wisdom. Let's pray. Father, thank you for this time of study on the contrast between a wise person and a foolish person. Like I said at the beginning, I think there's something in this for every one of us to relate to. Some point of surrender to the Holy Spirit right now in our lives where the Holy Spirit wants to point out a place where He is going to begin a good work in us to bring out the wisdom of Christ's life in us. So, Father, I want to ask each person in this room right now and anybody watching out there on media to take a moment and to erase the slate of all the things you think you need to work on. Because that becomes pretty biased. I know I could work on that because I can make that happen. <laughs> and so I get all the credit. Can you just wipe your slate clean of everything that you thought was on your list of things to correct and just right now ask the Holy Spirit where's the one place where you're going to start your work because I'm going to join you right there in accomplishing that in my life bring that to the Holy Spirit right now Thank you, Father, for all the work that your Holy Spirit is doing in each of our hearts right now to show us where you want to bring more of the life of Christ to our lives so we can be considered wise and let growth be happening every day for each one of us. And God, we are humbled by your greatness. We are sometimes enamored by our own opinion of our own greatness and we repent of that foolishness right now. We are in awe of your greatness and we would do well to proclaim your greatness as we leave here today so that nothing is done because we can do it but it's all done because you have done it. So we choose right now to praise your name by singing, How Great Thou Art. Would you please stand? Oh Lord, my God, when I in awesome wonder consider Yeah. 
Thank you. 